Perfect. Okay. First of all, apologies for being late. I was trying to do it through my phone, uh, but I guess it wasn't meant to be. So thank you very much for coming to week two of our training course, Think Like a Leader and Act Like a Leader. And today uh, we will discuss something that is actually very close uh, to my heart. Uh, we will discuss what it makes an authentic leader and we will talk a lot about personal branding and reputation management. But also we will discuss uh, a term that you are not very familiar with, maybe the way it's phrased now, but a term that I believe all of you recognize and that's the term, the term forgivability. Uh, one of the people that we uh, that we work very closely with is called Patrick Jefferson, and he is the former private secretary of Princess Diana, and he was the first and only chief of staff to Princess Diana. And uh, he has, you know, every time that we work together, he has something really interesting. Says something really interesting. We are all the reputation managers of our own individual brand. And the truth is that today we live in an era of personal branding. If you open LinkedIn, you will see a lot of people branding themselves as uh, branding guru, marketing guru. And sometimes people give this uh, status to themselves while there are times when uh, their followers where their fans actually give these kind of terms. So it's really, actually, it's quite confusing today what makes a good personal brand, who is actually the real leader and who is not, because we are living in an era where I believe that everyone, in a way, tries to create their, their own personal brand. But before we go deeper into, in, into the topic, I want to do a very short exercise with you, and you can write the comments on, uh, on the message board. I would like you to write one word that describes the person that you are about to see in the PowerPoint. What do you think about this guy? Richard Nixon, former president of the US, one of the few presidents that has been impeached. No comments. Like, what is the one thing that comes to your mind when you see this guy? Sassy. <laughs> but what is he most famous about? was actually, he's one of the few, I think the only president in the U.S. that was impeached because of the Watergate scandal. But you guys give very positive uh, feedback about him. So I don't know if the whole presentation will work actually at the end. Bill Clinton. What is the one thing that comes on your mind when you think of Bill Clinton? <laughs> I knew, I knew people were going to write Monica. A fair, okay. Very good. Richard Branson. Cool. Hard. I think Tony, you're the only one that cannot see. I think everyone else is fine. Okay. Successful. Good. Lance Armstrong. What do you think about him? I like that. Mm. Liar. Fighter. Happy. Okay, I think Maida is the only person that was right. He's a liar. Princess Diana. Fragile. PR. I like that. She's actually the ultimate PR machine. When we see each other live, I will explain to you uh, really the PR strategy behind Princess Diana because things are not always the way that, that uh, are presented. Good, let's move to the next slide. So basically, uh, <laughs> I see that we have some people that are not great fans of Princess Diana. But uh, as, you can, as I can notice from your comments, and also you can notice from your own comments, is that uh, once you see the picture of a leader, we have already d decided on the narrative about him. Uh, for example, and m maybe some of you will not agree with me, but when Obama became president of the U.S., we already accepted the narrative that he's going to be, uh, the president is going to bring a hope, the president is going to unite America, and things like that. But when you see his results, actually, you will see that he really hasn't done uh, 
something that is iconic. Now, for Donald Trump, and I know a lot of people are not fans of Donald Trump, I'm also not a fan of Donald Trump, but I'm having this conversation with my uh, PR friends, and I'm asking whether we have accepted the narrative for Donald Trump that he is this crazy guy, uh, and we are not actually giving him a chance uh, to show what he really is about. But that's, I think, it's, it's uh, something that we can discuss live. Anyway, this is Mary Jo Jacoby. She's the only person in the world that has worked for two U.S. presidents. She was appointed by the British Prime Minister. She was appointed by Queen Elizabeth. Most recently, she handled um, the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And she has a really... Uh, very good definition of what leadership is actually about. And I think all of you will connect with this, that at the end of the day, leadership is about forgivability. Now, you may be asking yourself, what, what is forgivability? And she gives a very good uh, definition of this. Um, forgivability is actually our reputation and the way we are perceived. And what is reputation? Reputation equals the experience of our client, customer, friend, fan, whatever, on the worst day, in the worst branch, with the worst employee. And our reputation and reputation of companies are actually defined by our actions on the worst day, at the worst branch, with the worst employees. Those brands and those people that have built forgivability that have created forgivability of themselves are those that will be forgiven and those that their reputation may be slightly intact but at the end of the day they will become they will come out of the situation stronger while those others that haven't built that haven't implemented forgivability are people brands that will not be forgiven richard nixon he has that kind of personality he doesn't have forgivability and so many years after his scandal he's still considered one of the worst presidents in the u.s bill clinton on the other hand and all of you wrote monica lewinsky but no one actually wrote that he's a bad president that he's a bad person no because he has that forgivability factor and even today when people talk about bill clinton yes there is the monica lewinsky stuff but at the end of the day they feel respect for bill clinton so what i'm trying to what i will try to present in the next 45 minutes to 50 minutes is how we as individuals, when we build our our brands, when we build our uh, personal brands, we can actually develop forgivability. Now, one thing that, you know, all of us are talking about leaders, 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 but one thing that we, we have to keep in mind, and it's a very harsh reality, is what is the one thing, the most important thing that a leader needs? And I would appreciate if you give, if you shout out some answers. So what is the one most important thing that makes a person a leader? What is the one thing that he needs to have to be a leader? Okay, I like this. It's part of the answer. I like this. Ability to influence others. Very good. Pretty much the one thing that all, that in order for one to be a leader, what does he need? Followers. Right? I mean, yes, you have the personal leadership skills and you have the charisma and you have the quality and you are smart and everything. But in, in, at the end of the day, to be perceived as a leader, you have to have followers, people that follow you, people that believe in your charisma, people that believe in your ideas, people that, uh, you know, that uh, connect to your lifestyle. So all of this is very important because at the end of the day, there is a difference between, you know, I'm a personal leader and if you're perceived a, a leader. So those, uh, the one most important thing that, you know, really makes a great leader and how you get followers is by creating a deep connection with your target audience. Now I will talk a little bit in business terms, but all of these things can actually be very much implemented into personal branding. And in order for you to position yourself as a leader, uh, obviously you have to identify your target group, you have to identify your brand promise, what you stand for. In business terms, you have to fit in archetype. Now, in business terms, there are 12 types of archetypes of brands. The first archetype is the innocent, and your goal is to be happy. Some of your traits are you strive to be good, you're pure, you're young, you're optimistic, you're simple, you're moral, you're romantic. And 
your brand promise or your niche in a way is you have strong values, you're seen as trustworthy, simple, but nostalgic. And one brand that is, uh, and m maybe some of you will not agree, but actually when you see their marketing, you will see that uh, they are really an innocent brand is Coca-Cola. The second archetype of brands or personal branding is the regular guy or a girl. And the goal of this regular guy or a girl is to belong and to connect with others. And the traits are they're very down to earth, they're supportive, they're faithful. They're the person next door, you know, you, you immediately connect with others. And their uh, brand promise or their niche is that they are, have common touch, solid virtues. They give a sense, sense of belonging. And in terms of brands, it's a brand like eBay. But I really think that Mark Zuckerberg is one of these guys that has, you know, personal branding archetype that is the regular guy, the girl. We connect with him. You don't see him as someone arrogant. It's a person that you could meet. You know, a person that could be your friend in high school. It's someone that you really connect with. Now, then we have the hero. And the goal of the heroes is to improve the world. They're courageous. They're bold, honorable, strong. They're inspirational. And their niches, they want to make a positive mark on the world. They want to solve major problems or enable, inspire others to solve problems. And, of course, Elon Musk is one of the ultimate hero because his really goal, his his main goal as a leader is actually to bring a positive change to the world. The next archetype is the outlaw. Their goal is to break the rules. They don't like authority. And they're very rebellious, they're wild, they're paving the way of change, and their niche is that they're seen as agents of change. Um, they allow people to vent or break with the conventions. And of course, Richard Branson is, I think, the first, when it comes to entrepreneurship, the first kind of outlaw of a brand that we see. Then we have the Explorer. It's a brand like Red Bull. And they are, uh, they find fulfillment through discovery and through new experiences. And they're restless, adventurous, ambitious, independent, pioneering. Then we have the Creator. And their goal is to create something with meaning and enduring value. Their traits, they're creative, imaginative, artistic, inventive, they're entrepreneurs, non-conformists, and their niche is that they're very visionary. They help I see my video is is everything okay up until now? Because my video is very slow. I guess everything is good. Good. So the creator. Then we move to the ruler. The ruler. This kind of brands, this kind of uh, personal brands, they want control. They want to create order from chaos. And they're really leaders. When you think of a leader in an expensive suit, that's it. That's the ruler. They're very organized. They're role models. They're all into small details. And they help people become more organized. They want to restore order, create more stability, and they want to uh, uh, create security in this crazy world. Then we have the magician. And the magicians, the goal of the magicians is to make dreams come true. They want to create something really special. They're visionary, they're charismatic, imaginative, idealistic, spiritual. And I think Steve Jobs, when it comes to personal brands, is actually the magician because he wants to help people transform the world, inspire change, expand consciousness. And then we have the lover. Their goal is to create intimacy, to inspire love. It's a brand like Victoria's Secret. And their traits, they're very passionate, sensual, romantic, warm, and idealistic and their niche is they want to help people feel appreciated they they want to f f make people that uh, feel that they belong somewhere they, they enjoy intimacy they build relationship <coughs> then we have the caregiver the goal of the caregiver is to care for and protect others the traits they're caring they're maternal they're nurturing they're generous they're compassionate and their niche is they would help people care for themselves serve the public through healthcare, education, and aid. Then we have the jester. And the goal of the jester is to bring joy to the world. And they're all about fun, sense of humor, lighthearted, mischievous. And their niche and their, in a way, marketing promise is to help people have a good time or enjoy what they're doing. And then the, the last kind of archetype is the sage. And the sage the goal of the sage is to help the world gain wisdom and insights. A company like Google. They're knowledgeable, trust the source of information, wisdom and intelligence. They're analytical, they're mentors, they're gurus. And their niche is to help people 
to better understand the world and provide practical information and analysis. So, can you hear me now? So, based on these 12 categories of, of archetypes of personal branding and brand, where do you fit? And by the way, those people that are really, you know, the leaders that we admire are a combination of, of all of this. So where do you belong? Which archetype do you identify yourself the most? Ah, I like that. Do we have any lovers here? Only one answer. But as you can see, and I, obviously you can go, uh, when we finish this, you can go back to the presentation. But what is really important is that you really identify your niche because at the end of the day when you create a personal brand the traits are very very much similar to when you create a corporate brand it's all about the promise what kind of promise you're giving what kind of problem you want to solve and most of the time you will identify this niche by analyzing these 12 archetypes and you will see when it comes to your personal brand where does your brand what is your arch archetype now uh, you've read a lot about personal branding, so I will not go into too much into details because I want to focus more on the reputation part and the crisis communication part. But when it comes to personal branding, I think there are five rules that uh, pretty much connect everyone and five rules that are pretty much applicable to, to, uh, to anyone that actually wants to build a personal brand. The, not, the most important thing is to be yourself. Because you'll be found out if you try to fool people by imitating something that you're not. And you have Lance Armstrong. Uh, he was seen as a leader, uh, not just a great sportsman. He was a best-selling author. He, uh, you know, huge brands uh, uh, sponsor him. But at the end of the day, uh, he was fake. And that's because he was using, you know, like all this uh, medicine that was not approved. So I think the number one thing when it comes to personal brand is you really have to be yourself. And because if you imitate others, if you try to be something else, you know, you cannot, how long can you act to be something that you're not? So find, as, I, as we discussed last time, find that one thing that makes you special and present that to the world. Uh, I really don't like this copy-paste attitude of, of branding today, um, that people, they've seen the Wolf of Wall Street or they buy an expensive suit and immediately they think, I'm the leader. Or, you know, these photos with the uh, uh, watches on Instagram and with fast cars, that doesn't make you a leader. You know, people that are actually really, really successful and have money, they don't take photos with their cars and with their watches. Number two, and this is very much connected also to, to the corporate world, is you have to be clear about your point of view and make it public. Now, why is this important? Because all of these leaders that we admire, they have one single point of view and they're sticking to it. They're not changing their views every week. You know, this is my point of view. Now, the throwback is that not everyone will agree with your point of view, but it doesn't matter because your followers will agree with your point of view. And you will, and some people will be upset with your point of view. They will not agree with you. But if you know your message and you're willing to stick your neck out and to express yourself, you will really try to get people to follow you and to understand your mission. Number three, successful branding requires having a plan. So you have to make, in a way, your, your branding based on the brand strategy. You have to identify your goals. You have to see what your brand stands for. You have to establish that brand promise. And it's very interesting. All of these big campaigns that we see, Dove, Nike, all of them are actually based on a brand promise. So every time we see the advert, every time we buy that product, we actually buy the brand promise. So what is, for example, the brand promise of Nike? Anyone? And it's not just do it. Quality, okay. But what is the brand promise? When you think of a Nike product, when you see a Nike commercial, like what do you feel? Freedom, love it. But also, what is their main goal? If you have a body, 
you are an athlete right if you have a body you're an athlete and that's their brand promise so when you see those commercials when you see Nike stores no matter how overweight you are or you're not in a great shape or you feel like I just don't want to do it you know you just feel like if you buy their equipment you're buying into a dream and at the end of the day the athlete in you will wake up and you'll become a great sportsman and it ha all has to do you know with the brand promise so when you create your brand or if you already have created the personal brand of yourself ask yourself what is my brand promise because if you have a clear brand promise then the followers you know will connect with you because most of them will actually also believe in the same brand promise now a lot of the people when they build a personal brand the one thing and all of us do it i mean everyone is guilty of this it's all you, you feel like i want people to know me i want people people to appreciate me you're looking for the the fame right but actually when you think about it you only need to be known to the people who are making decisions about you and those who influence them not everyone has to know you only your target group has to know you they have to believe in your brand they have to believe in your purpose because one thing that you have to understand is branding is not about you it's about serving others and a lot of brands fail and are fake when all of this you know uh, all of these people that have created this cult following around them uh, they realize you know people realize actually all of this is because of them it's not about serving others so you have to be really careful about this and then number five and I think it's very important in everything we do is measure and you don't have to measure in in long terms I don't know uh, it doesn't mean that oh, I make only 20,000 a month uh, I will be a pers a big brand when I make I don't know 40,000 or something like that just measure the small things whatever your goals document your goals and focus on them and measure the momentum measure the small things because at the end of the day is those small things to be actually bring you to the goal now let's move into something more interesting crisis communications and reputation management and um, we'll discuss now something that a lot of people consider it's PR and communications well when you think about it it's something that a lot of leaders lack and number two is a lot of leaders fail because they really do not understand uh, or they do not implement the right strategy when it comes to crisis now first of all when it comes to crisis communications there there is one thing to remember there is a difference between crisis and an issue if you work for a telecom and for 10 minutes there is no network that's not crisis that's an issue so we have to you know when, when crisis happen or issues happen we have to think is this a crisis or this is an issue now when it comes to crisis these are the six things that are considered a crisis when there is loss of life or life-changing injury when there is inability to operate when there is a threat to national security when there is unexpected unexpected regulatory action and when there is change in the political environment and when there is serious commercial risk if when you are the CEO of a company any of these six things happen you need to enter crisis mode if something happens that does not fit in the six categories you're facing an issue you're not facing a crisis now this is I just spent a couple of days with Donald Steele who is um, crisis communication expert and he's handling all the biggest airline disasters and uh, helping airline companies uh, in their crisis communication and he has a really good definition of a crisis crisis is any situation that has the potential to affect long-term confidence in the brand organization and its people and which can interfere with its ability to continue operating normally now there are three sources of crisis your product your people or from nowhere can you name one crisis that came out of the product and it actually affected the long term of the company <coughs> there was one very recent one no I mean uh, Blackberry had an issue that they didn't solve Galaxy Note perfect Volkswagen the Cabesco in Bosnia Herzegovina I'm not familiar of this but would love to hear more about it so for example Samsung with the Galaxy Note they did a huge campaign they launched the product but what happened the product had faults in it so 
the company now when the new Samsung S8 came out had really needed to make sure to provide the best product because it could not afford to make another mistake. Now, your people, can you name a crisis that came because of people, that happened because of people's mistakes? Are we going to have any answers? The Prince of Spain. Okay. Plane crash. Yeah. German wings. It's because of people. But also, have you seen these Domino's uh, pizza videos when some of the employees are actually, um, you know, taking buggers out of their nose and they're putting on the pizza and they're delivering the pizza? And this is a huge problem for Domino's. American Airlines is the people. But what is really interesting, and I will discuss this later about American Airlines, it was actually the the company that uh, did that is not American Airlines. It's a company that American Airlines paid to deal uh, with uh, with passengers. But at the end of the day, it's American Airlines that paid the company, so American Airlines has to apologize. And the, three, the, the third source of crisis is when it comes out of nowhere. Now, the biggest crisis experts will tell you, if aliens invaded the city of Los Angeles, I will accept the label unprecedented. Otherwise, all crises are predictable. If they can be predicted, they can be planned for. So in today's world, uh, you know, a lot of, and even in Macedonia right now, there is a crisis with a big bang and the, the, the not just the, the senior management is not communicating, but they don't really understand what is happening. And they're saying, oh, well, we didn't prepare for this. We didn't know that something like this could happen. The thing is, anything you can imagine can happen, and you have to plan for all of these kind of things. And especially if you're a CEO, you have to get your communications team together and start planning. Because when crisis hits you, if you're not prepared, if it's not planned, it can be disastrous for your company. For sources for crisis, we have natural causes like fire, earthquakes, floods. Then we have influence by external factors, kidnapping, fraud, media, mail uh, threats, arson. And then we have influence by internal factors, extended power outrage, internal fraud, loss of critical infrastructure, failure of critical controls, etc. Now, the world of crisis communication has changed very rapidly. Why? Because of the camera phone. This is the best and the most dangerous thing in the world. Why? Because before something would happen and we would have to wait for news, to turn on the news and to see what happened. Right now, the video that leaked from American Airlines was a video recorded with a phone. So this for companies is actually becoming a huge issue. Number two is once you record a video, you can upload it in seconds. It means that it's available in the public in seconds. And the third thing, which is becoming a huge problem for a lot of companies, is, of course, the fake news. And in Macedonia, we are very famous for producing fake news about Donald Trump. And there was even analysis that this group from Vales actually uh, created fake news for Donald Trump. So the camera phone is a great thing, but it's, it can also be very dangerous. And bad information travels a lot faster. So what does this mean? This means that the crisis communications time timetable has changed because before the way uh, crisis happened is, you know, before the age of Internet is something would happen um, and the journalist will call you and then you will say, oh, yeah, let me check with my CEO and we'll prepare a statement. And sometimes it can take hours for the crisis to develop or hours uh, for you if you're the company to hide the crisis because, you know, you can bribe a journalist and you pretty much uh, kill the news. But now, these are the rules. When crisis hit, and I'm not talking about issue, I'm talking about crisis, your initial response on social media needs to be in 15 minutes. 15 minutes. What does this mean? That you have to have everything prepared in advance. That's why crisis is all about preparation. If you're prepared, you can have a general statement ready for social media. Of course, based on the situation, you can adapt it. But if you are prepared, if you've planned for it, you can put the social media response out in 15 minutes. Why is it important to put the, the initial response to social media in 15 minutes? Anyone?
taking control. Perfect. Amazing. Because this way you start controlling the narrative. If you don't post anything in 15 minutes, people will start creating their own stories. And you may not even be guilty in the situation, but people already would have accepted the narrative that was presented to them that was created by someone else. So if you work in PR, if you're a leader, if you're a CEO, if something happens, if crisis happen, first initial response, 15 minutes. Initial statement to media in 30 minutes. You have to inform the media of what has happened. Fuller statement to media or interview in 60 minutes. And the press conference should be from 90 minutes to 120 minutes. And the reality is, if you haven't planned, if you haven't rehearsed, there is no way to do this. Especially in our region, former Yugoslavia, you will see that a lot of companies haven't planned, they're not prepared, so there is no way, rarely someone makes a statement in 15 minutes or got or a conference in 90 to 120 minutes. But these are international rules that have to be followed in order for you to build on that forgivability. Now, crisis happens, you have to create a crisis statement. All crisis statements must contain the two Fs if you're to communicate across international cultures. Number one, fact. What has happened? What are you doing about it? This is very important. You acknowledge this has happened. And what are you doing about it? The actions of your company, of your brand towards the crisis. Number two, and very important, feeling. Now, you have to show feeling, but this is not an apology. It is most commonly a statement of your values or an empathy with the victims. For example, God forbid, when a plane crash happens, you have to show, you know, you still don't have the results. You don't know what is the cause of the accident. You're presenting the fact. You're presenting that today at 10.20 a.m., flight number 128, flying from Boeing, this kind of Boeing, has crashed. What are you doing about it? We are currently uh, working with the authorities to identify what is the cause of the crash. Feeling. You don't apologize because you don't know what was, you know, you don't know what was the cause of the plane crash. So you don't want to, you don't want to make that apology too early without having the evidence. But you are showing remorse. As a CEO, your statement should be right now the priority of myself and our company is the victims and their families. And this is the number one rule when crisis happens. Your priority is always the victims and the families of the victims. Moving on. Crisis statement rule. How do you write your crisis statement? And these are the things you will need for your, uh, actually for your uh, homework. Now, silence, a lot of people say, oh, we will uh, say, oh, we will not say anything, it will pass. Well, silence is actually communicating. Because a lot of the public thinks if you're silent, you're actually guilty. The most important thing in your crisis st statement mm -hmm. is to tell the truth. Because you use the statements to take control. We discussed, you have 15 minutes to make the first statements. Because what you say remains the most important, but using all channels to say it is now vital. You cannot call the journalist first. You have to... Call the journalist, you have to be on Facebook, on Twitter. So you also have to adapt your message based on the Twitter accounts. You know, a lot of people have, they're preparing a long press release. Well, guess what? You cannot paste the whole press release in the 150 characters that Twitter has. Now, a lot of people are not, you know, they think, oh, the crisis will pass, companies will survive. But I want to show you the economics side of it. Companies judged to have responded in a, uh, in a, in a, in a adequately to major emergencies lost an average of 15% of their net stock value in the following months. 15%. This is a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, those which managed an effective response gained an average 5% in the net stock value over the same period of time. This pretty much shows you how important it is to make the statement fast, to be clear about it, and to communicate. If you're not doing it, you can lose 15% of your stock value. And if you're doing it, if you're doing it correctly, people will not just forgive you, but you can, it also makes economic sense because based on research, companies gained 5% in net stock value. Now, <coughs> you make your statement, 
it's on Facebook, on social media, you send it to, um, to the media, but now it's time for your interview. Because as a CEO of a company, guess what? You will be the one doing the interview because you are the leader. You want to show control. Number one, what you say is the most important, but who says it and how they look is very important indeed. I will tell you one, it, to you it may seem like a funny example, but it's something that happened. A police, the head of, uh, the head of a police unit in the UK, in a, in a town in the UK, was fired because she didn't look good during the press conference. She didn't have her, hair, her uh, hair made. She didn't have the proper clothes. Why do you think she was fired? And it's not sexist, by the way. It was a woman, but she wasn't fired for that reasons. But why do you think a head of a police department would be fired for not looking the way they should? And she looked normal. I mean, it's 2 a.m. Obviously, she was woken up from bed. Wrong impression. But why? What does this wrong impression say about the company, about the department? Exactly. The person has no control. Because the media, the people are saying, if she cannot make her hair for the press conference, then how is she supposed to take control of the situation? Now, this is a very high risk moment. So what I advise to all of you is to do media trainings because this is very important. Journalists, a lot of PR people say are bad people. <laughs> and why do they say journalists are bad people? Because the journalist, the journalist is, uh, journalist is not interested in the pink story. He wants a dark story. He wants to make you feel guilty. And sometimes, of course, this, uh, you know, this uh, corporates are guilty, but in a in a free media world the job of the journalist is obviously to put you in the corner so you have to be really really media trend you have to focus on key messages uh and you, you are not supposed to go beyond statement and you have to communicate your very values all the time now what does it mean focus on key messages what is the first thing that a ceo is asked during a crisis just a second Good, I'm back. Sorry, it was dark. What is the one thing that journalists ask the CEO when a crisis happens? Okay, what are you going to do? What happened? But what is the most common thing? Will you resign? Most of the CEOs, when the big crisis happen, are asked by journalists, will you resign? Now, resigning is not a topic to be discussed during the crisis. So you have to focus on the key message. And what is the key message? The key message is that right now, our priority is the victims and their family or the people that were affected. Because journalists will try to push you towards a different path. You have to stick to your path. You have to stick to your statement. Key message, I will not resign. No, uh, I mean, you cannot bluntly say I will not resign, but take the journalists on your path. Right now, the future, my future in the company is not the priority of the company. Right now, the, our priority is the victims and the families or those that have been affected. There is your path, there is the path of the journalist. Your job as the CEO is to take the journalist on your path. And this is not very easy, it can be very complicated. Now, here are some useful phrases when it comes to crisis interviews. You know, I don't know, crisis happened 20 minutes ago. Obviously, the company does not have the full details. The media wants to know everything. So a proper answer would be, I don't have this information right now. What I can tell you is, so you see, you take again the journalist back to your path. When they ask you, will you resign? Our first priority right now is, so again, you take the journalist on your path. Is it, they will ask you, uh, why, did, why did this happen? Is the job of the authorities to investigate. Our job is to support those affected. 
when a journalist starts to be very harsh, they start criticizing the company, the leader or whatever, I don't recognize the picture you're painting. The real truth is, and you go back to your path. Again, when they criticize you, when the, what the public expect is that we will do everything to support those affected. And that's where we'll be putting all of our efforts. And, you know, basically, <clears throat> You go back to your key statement. You go back to your key statement. Because really, when crisis happens, you will not have all of this information. So what is really important is to continuously take the journalist or whoever is interviewing you on your path. Now, you're giving your crisis statement inside for a press conference. Location and organization is vital. Role of the moderator is critical. The moderator is the person that actually moderates the conference, that takes questions from the audience and usually this is the director of communications efficient way of getting information to a lot of journalists you have to have an exit strategy and you should never speculate now a question if you are in you know these conference ballrooms where most of these press conferences are made where should you set the stage next to what you can type your question <coughs> Perfect. Exit and door. That's an, and it's so funny when sometimes I go to a press conference and I see, and obviously, I mean, it's a nice launch. It's not a conference, a press conference for a crisis thing, but they put it in the middle of the room or far away from the exit. The key rule when it comes to press conference, you're always close to the exit. And one thing you should always expect is if your director of communications tell the journalists, uh, you know, we will only cover six questions. The journalists will say only six. You can say we'll cover only 10 questions. They will say only 10. So you will never satisfy the journalist. What is really important? You make your key statements, you answer a couple of questions, and you leave. And what is really important is to always have the right security because there are press conferences when uh, a family of the victim enters the press conference, they start attacking the CEO and stuff like that. So you really have to be prepared. You have to do the screening and you have to make sure, you know, you always stick to your key statement. Now, take some take homes for today. Speed is now the critical factor, 15, 30, 60, 90. We discussed this. To be quick, we must plan because as we said, all crises are predictable and citizens see the world through their camera lens. And all of us do. Now, a very quick case study about what we discussed, the importance of being quick. Are you familiar with the Asiana Airlines crash in San Francisco on 6 July 2013? Asiana Airlines is an airline from, San, uh, from South Korea. They were flying from Seoul to San Francisco and they crashed. Now, the crash happened at 11.27. The first tweet from the witness came at 11.28. One minute after the crash, there was a passenger waiting to board on her plane when she noticed flames. 11.28. The first tweet of the company came at 12.39. You see how fast things are moving. First tweet, crash 11.27. First tweet, 11.28. Comp, the, cor, uh, the first tweet by the corporation, 12.39. In the meantime, the corporation is completely losing control of the narrative because Rima, Sarah, and Meg are all journalists who are writing to Krista, who just made published the tweet, and they're writing to her. Hi, Krista, I'm with NPR. We'd love to talk with you ASAP. And they did talk with her, and Krista gave a statement. What's happening in the meantime with the company? Nothing. They haven't made any statement. The media has already decided on the narrative. We have decided of the narrative that they're not incompetent. One guy, he's a Samsung executive. He records a whole video of the crash. Still, there is no response of the company. In the meantime, what happens? The website crashes of San Francisco airport. So people do not have access to official information. Everything is happening on social media. 62 minutes later, Asiana Airlines tweets. Thank you for your concern and support at this time. We are currently investigating and will update the news as soon as possible. What do you think about this statement? No empathy. And they're saying thank you for your concern and support. They're, they're putting themselves in the center 
that they are the victims when it's actually the people that were hurt and there were two victims actually that should be the center of the statement but they yeah they were like oh my god let's just write something whatever thank you for your concern and support this time you're currently investigating and we'll update with news as soon as possible really bad really late 62 minutes but what you have to understand is also in an international world even though we live in a global uh, world uh there's there's still cultural differences asiana airlines is an asian company south korean company they're not american in terms of communicating you know if this was an american company there would be a lot of empathy uh we are really you know an apology or whatever but asiana airlines and this is very also very important when you do international communications to to adapt your communication strategy to the market we operate they simply did not know what to say yeah they were buying buying more time but in this kind of crisis for this kind of brands there is no such thing as I'm buying more time because 62 minutes later the narrative is already done and you know people start commenting the fact that asiana airlines has not yet made a statement on twitter or facebook is unacceptable people are furious at their company of course the company survived and they changed the communication strategy uh but at the end of the day uh it was the first example actually in a social media era of how fast the comp uh, the information travels and how and why those 15 minutes are so important another example of a very recent crisis communication is the Volkswagen emission scandals and you have a detailed overview of the emission scandals in in the powerpoint but in this timeline Uh, you will see some of the mistakes that uh, you know the company did for example in september 23rd Volkswagen CEO Martin Winterkorn resigns he takes responsibility for irregularities found by US inspectors but he insists he personally did nothing wrong if you are a CEO even if you haven't done nothing wrong it's your responsibility of course he had to design october 8 Volkswagen top US executive Michael Horn testifies before congress he apologizes for the scandal and blames it on a couple of software engineers very incompetent very incompetent on march 10th of course he resigned did you guys have a chance to go through the powerpoint presentation did you see uh did you see michael's uh ap apology during the launch of the new passat in uh, in the states just days after the emission scandals What did you think about it? Basically this was his apology. This was a couple of software engineers who put this in for whatever reason. And then what does he do? There is the launch of the Passat and he goes there and he behaves like the biggest superstar blaming others and saying Oh sorry, I guess we fucked up. And you know what is the 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 back story of this Volkswagen knew about this for 9 months before. They were being warned for 9 months and they didn't do anything about it. And of course this guy would be fired. During the biggest emission scandals, he goes out like Steve Jobs were launching the iPhone and saying we fucked up. Well sorry, it's a bit too late. You should be fired. But why was his apology ineffective? He didn't demonstrate remorse. And this is very important saying sorry he failed to give details how the company ended in this situation he didn't explain anything he just said oh we fucked up he didn't give specifics how the company would become more transparent he didn't say yes we realized there was a mistake and Volkswagen is doing 1 2 3 to make sure that this doesn't happen again and he didn't inform the public about the new procedures that would take place to handle the crisis and these things are very important so when you write your homework when you write your apology show remorse give details how the company ended up in this situation be transparent and inform the to handle the crisis very important on the other hand general motors also had problems with emission scandals but look at their statement Sincere apologies to everyone who has been affected by this recall, especially to the families and friends of those who lost their lives or were injured. I'm deeply sorry. This is a statement. This should this is how a statement should look. There is a remorse, there is the apology. Now, 
Volkswagen isn't alone. Here are some of the worst CEO apologies. Tony Hayward. It's more like political scandal. It was all known years ago by the research of that. Yeah, I mean, they. So the, this is actually the, the the saddest part about Volkswagen. They had indication and information long before the information went public, mainstream public. So they could have prepared, planned. They could have even sorted it, but they didn't do it. So that's why. It was it was a huge scandal because at the end of the day you, they had a long time to prepare but they didn't do anything about it. On the PowerPoint I've sent you, I also put the example of Tony Hayward from British Petroleum. You know, uh, he did two big mistakes. When the Deepwater Horizon happened, when the explosion in the Gulf of Mexico happened, the next day he went on a yacht trip with his son. You don't do that. When there, when there are lives involved, when there are victims, if you're the CEO of a company, the next day you don't go on a yacht with your son. And then the second thing is he said something that is completely stupid. We are sorry for the massive disruption it's caused their lives. There is no one who wants this over more than I do. I would like my life back. There are like four people that died in the platform that will never have their lives back. And you want your life back? And of course, he was fired because he couldn't show remorse. Now, I want to go just through. <coughs> sorry, I just want to go through two statements. I want to hear your views about this. Uh, this is Reddit CEO Ellen Powell, and this is her apology for the abrupt, uh, abrupt uh, firing of one of the most popular employees. Um, in the company. So when they announced that this employee would have been fired, there was a huge backlash. And her uh, response is, we screwed up, not just on July 2nd, but also over the past several years. We haven't communicated well, and we have surprised moderators and the community with big changes. What do you think about this apology? Yes, no remorse. Honest? Well, I don't think it was honest. What is the one thing you noticed? The first thing. She didn't even address the firing. She didn't even address the person. And number two, and the saddest part of all of this, is that she blamed uh, the company's previous leaders. She didn't say anything about She is the one that fired him, but she doesn't mention anything about that person. And she actually blames on them. On the previous management very bad now she gave i don't even uh, i know him as a takata from takata you know they make honest but not an apology no you know uh nure let me tell you there are no emotions in business that that's the number one thing uh and she may it's and, it, and it's not about what you want to say it's about how you're gonna be understood so yeah and maybe she didn't feel any remorse. Maybe she was like, you know, he was a bad person. But the thing is, when you have a backlash of people uh, going against your decision, you have to address that issue. You cannot just ignore the issue and blame the issue on someone else. Takata from Takata. You know, they are uh, they're producing airbags, airbags for... Um, for children and there were eight deaths and hundreds of uh, accident injuries and uh, the statement of the CEO of Takata was I'm sorry for the people who died or were injured I'm sorry our products hurt people despite the fact that we are a supplier of safety products what do you think about this <laughs> I like that I think sorry is not enough Yeah, it doesn't show that the company will, you know, will take any responsibility for the victims, financial or whatever. You know, he's sorry people died. I'm sorry our progress hurt, but it's like, okay, what is the next step? What is the plan? Nothing. He was also fired. I like how you guys think. I think uh, you get the whole point. And, you know, most of the time these things are... Um, logical to many of us but i will give you a very quick example uh, one of macedonia's main most popular banks was robbed by an employee a month ago 
And what is the first logical thing that you would do if you realize that there is a 2 million euros missing from your bank stolen by employees? What do you think as a CEO you should do? Think you're tired, no more replies. Anyway, as a CEO, you know, they should have you know, put the statement out in 15 minutes, you know, do a media interview in 30 minutes, call a press conference and say this, this is what happened. But they didn't even make a statement. They didn't organize a press conference. And the worst part is the next day they called a press conference for a launch of new product. You never do that. Why? Because the journalists didn't come for the new product. They came for the crisis. And the whole crisis became even worse because the CEO would not reply to questions about the crisis. He was concentrating on the product. So pretty much everything failed. And then there is uh, very fast action. I'm back. Can you hear me now? Very good. See, I didn't even need 15 minutes. I'm already like coming with a statement. I do apologize for the technical difficulties. And I promise you that we are doing everything in our power to solve the technical issues of this presentation. Anyway, we are towards the end. <laughs> so my whole point with uh, Right now, what is really important is the technical capabilities of my computer. I will discuss the future of my company, of me as a lecturer later. Anyway, uh, the last example was about Taylor Swift being against not being paid for Apple Music. So the company, you know, they acted so fast that they didn't, they didn't even have to uh, apologize. You know, one of their uh, senior executives on uh, Twitter wrote, Apple Music will pay artists for streaming, even during customers' free trial period. We hear you, Taylor Swift, and indie artists love Apple. So this is all about the fast action. If you're fast enough, you know, you don't even have to bother with crisis statements and things like that. Now, just to wrap it up, just I want to go through the five C's of crisis communication. So basically the five things that you need to have. Uh, wait, I can see the presentation. Is it bugged? Yeah, you can see the presentation. I can see the presentation. Can everyone? See, can you see the slide, the five C's of crisis communications? Yeah, okay, good. No, no. Slide didn't. Hmm, I can see it. Now? Anyways, the last slide, so no. Uh, okay. I do apologize for the inconvenience, but it's the last slide, so let's not 
make more technical issues and I will just cover it really quickly and you will have it on your um, issue it's yeah it's issue. yeah fast learner KJ so the five C's of crisis communication number one a crisis manager must approach the crisis with confidence built on planning and learning again it's all about planning and learning crisis planning and rehearsing can help build that confidence bearing in mind that no crisis unfolds the way it was rehearsed Number two, a crisis manager must show compassion to those affected by what's happened and be empathetic to the stakeholders who have been affected, both externally and internally. Number three, a crisis manager must have the courage to speak up, to advise, and to act. Number four, clarity. A crisis manager must have clarity of thought and must communicate clearly to help others understand what's happened and what's being done about it. And the fifth and the most important thing is a crisis manager must communicate, communicate and communicate throughout the entire crisis period. So confidence, compassion, courage, clarity. And when you do the exercise, concentrate on this clarity. You must communicate clearly to help others understand what's happened and what's being done about it. And the last thing is communications. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Now, for your assignment, this will be group work. So taking into consideration the importance of reputation management and brand building, especially in times of crisis, imagine that your team handled the communications department and Volkswagen in the US. Please appoint in your team communications director, media relations director, and peer managers. Now, together, in cooperation with the media relations team and the peer managers, your communications director, in this case your team leader, should prepare a communications crisis strategy based on the following scenario. So this is crisis scenario, role play. This is the preparing part. Your president and CEO is about to deliver a speech at the launch of the new Volkswagen Passat, which is just days after the emission scandal goes public. The communication strategies should contain scenario for the event, 500 words, a press release to be handed out to the media at the event, 500 words, and the opening speech of the CEO that focuses on the scandals, how it happened, a formal apology, and the next steps that the company will take to avoid this to happen in the future, 500 words. So basically, imagine yourself, you're the communications team, you work for Volkswagen, you're about to launch the new Volkswagen Passat, your CEO is about to go on stage, you organize the event, you put the scenario together, you put the press release that you will hand out to all the journalists, and finally, and most importantly, you write the speech of your CEO. Are we clear? That's all for today. Oh, we are not clear. Oh, we are clear. Yes, okay, perfect. And I think your teams are already assigned. Uh, do we have any questions that you would like to discuss now or everything has been clear? Um, and most of you, when you start getting senior positions, you will get this crisis. If you work for a decent company, you will get the, the training for crisis communications. And But again, like, be clear, communicate, and obviously show what are the next steps. And this is this is actually the only way to uh, to build forgivability. Saying sorry, sorry seems to be the hardest word. That's why so many uh, business professional companies fail. Okay, cool. Thank you, everyone. I would like to apologize for the technical issue uh, that I had during the presentation. And I would like to wish you a great week. I hope all of you submitted the blog for last week's homework. And I really wish you a crisis-free week. And whatever you need, I'm here. Thank you so much. And I'll see you next week when we'll talk about communications and media training and this kind of stuff. So 